Once I first came to the scene of parental alienation, I heard some talk about how the relationship with the alienator and the alienated child is like a cult. I, I agreed, like it felt like a cult, but I couldn't really t pinpoint how or why. But after reading this book, there's no doubt in my mind it absolutely is a cult. A little bit about Dr. Hassan. Dr. Hassan is a former cult member who has been involved in educating the public about mind control and destructive cults since 1976. He's also a licensed mental health counselor and holds a master's degree in counseling psychology from Cambridge College. He has written many books and he's been on hundreds of TV and radio shows. He's also known as America's leading cult expert, so I think we're in good hands here. I wrote some notes out for this one because boy oh boy, let's get into it. Right off the bat, Dr. Hassan actually states that cults often attract people during transitional stages in their lives and use this vulnerability to manipulate them. Right away, I wrote in the margin, divorce. And that's exactly what happens. The parent uses the transitional stage of the divorce when the child is especially vulnerable to pull them into their cult. He lists three main elements that characterize a destructive cult. Authoritarian leadership, deception, and destructive mind control. First, let's talk about authoritarian leadership. Authoritarian leadership refers to someone who's in charge of a group or a person who has con complete control or near complete control. The authoritarian leader, in the end, deceives members and robs them of their individuality. A parent, obviously, has this authoritarian leadership over their child, especially a younger child, especially a parent during a divorce. Deception. It talks about recruiting and how cult leaders are often very insidious in their recruiting, and this applies to parental alienation. It actually says, and I quote, members often speak and act with the greatest sincerity, having been subjected to the same techniques they use to recruit others. Whew. But that's also creepy. I mean, with deception, right off the bat, we're thinking lies, exaggerations, emotional manipulations, installing false memories, the list goes on. Check. And then the third element is destructive mind control. The book defines how this happens. Destructive mind control will disrupt a person's authentic identity and replace it with a new identity. The book also talks about common characteristics of a cult. At this point when I was reading the book, I just you know, I was creeped out, but at the same time, it was validating. Because as a child, being alienated from a parent who is pathological, and I don't say that in a mean way, I just mean personality disordered and believing their own lies, delusions. In that situation, in this cult-like situation, you really don't stand a chance. There are common characteristics of cults, which is the first one is isolation. This involves manipulation, deception, secrecy, dependency, lack of communication, and then also abuse of power, including psychological blackmail, threats, intimidation, cult leader asking for money or property, which in this case it would be like the alienator making the child ask for money or property, which my mom did. Third is the creation of a cult identity. He talks about this a lot in the book, and some of these quotes I've heard from targeted parents it says, I don't recognize my own bright, warm, loving son anymore. And the cult leader tries to control the member's behavior, thoughts, and emotions. I know I'm going through this kind of fast, but we'll go on to chapter two now. Chapter two talks about destructive social influences. Right off the bat, Dr. Hassan talks about how after World War II, many people wondered how ordinary German citizens could participate in the genocide. He starts off with discussing Solomon Ash and his group conformity study. Ash did a famous group conformity study. He showed his subjects different series of lines of varying sizes and asked them to approximate which sizes were the same. Participants knowingly chose the wrong sized line. Approximately two thirds went along with the obviously wrong answer due to social pressure. Next, the book talks about Stanley Milgram and his famous shock box experiment. You've probably heard of this in psychology class, but two thirds of the subjects in this shock box experiment flipped a series of levers which seemed to be passing increasingly high levels of electricity to a man with a phony heart condition. And 
they were told to give him more and more electric shocks in higher amounts and the result was that most people actually did succumb to the pressure following what they thought was a legitimate authority figure and actually went on to kill the man or what they thought was to kill the man just because they were ordered to be, obey. Both of these studies show the obvious effect, strong effect of social pressure and how conformity happens. In the last experiment he talks about is Dr. Philip Zimbardo and the now famous experiment of the prison. Philosophers, dramatists, uh, theologians have grappled with this question for centuries. What makes people go wrong? Dr. Zimbardo took 21 emotionally stable, mature, and law-abiding student volunteers. He divided them into two groups guards and prisoners. The experiment was supposed to last two weeks, but it had to be stopped after just six days. The guards adopted their roles as prison guards with alarming eagerness. One of the guards even reported, I was surprised at myself. I made the prisoners call each other names and clean out the toilets with their bare hands. I practically considered the prisoners cattle, and I kept thinking, I have to watch out for them in case they try to do something. All these men are law-abiding citizens, and yet just because they were made to play the role of a guard, they started to think poorly of the prisoners and think that the prisoners had actually done something wrong. Crazy. So what ended up happening in the prison experiment is that within a few days, all the prisoners actually organized a rebellion. Quote, they tore off their ID numbers and barricaded themselves inside their cells. The guards sprayed them with a fire extinguisher, burst into their cells, stripped them, took away their beds, and thoroughly intimidated them. Zimbardo was surprised. Zimbardo and his colleagues had not expected this outcome. Such a rapid transformation in these men. Zimbardo said, quote, What was most surprising about the outcome of this simulated prison experience was the ease with which the sadistic behavior could be elicited from quite normal young men and the contagious spread of emotional pathology among those carefully selected precisely for their emotional stability. I love that he says that because this shows that even an emotionally healthy, a stable person can be taught to hate just like that. The experiment lasted less than a week and it really demonstrates the frightening way in which a person's identity depends on the role he is playing. If you relate this back to parental alienation, the child is made to play a role in which they are standing up to what they believe is injustice because they believe, they've been made to believe their other parent is bad, abusive, unloving, whatever it may be, and they're made to play a role they take on that role. Since the study Zimbardo has become a leader in this field, he taught Dr. Hassan what's called the fundamental attribution error, which explains how people consistently attribute other people's behaviors to their own dispositions rather than to environmental factors. For example, your child is alienated and is being angry and hateful and some people might see a child like that and attribute it to the child's personality or the child's disposition when in reality the child is behaving like that because of the environment it is in. What's really interesting is what comes next. Social psychologist Robert Cialdini extracted six universal principles of influence. Influences that are so great that they can generate desirable change even in the widest range of circumstances. These principles apply to how a parent is manages to get their child to turn on their other loving parent. The first is reciprocation. It is widely known that people are more likely to do favors and perform requests for others who have already done them favors and provided such things for them first. Parents, you know, they provide so many things for their children, so of course this applies to parents and their children. I mean, my kids are toddlers and they're constantly like picking me flowers and drawing me pictures and I've done enough research in psychology to know that like children want to pay their parents back. Children want to return all the love and care their parents give to them, and they do so in small gestures. Number two is commitment and consistency. People are more likely to be motivated in a particular direction if they see it as a consistent or an existing commitment. I think it goes without saying that children are committed to loving their parents. Number three is also related authority, which is the simple fact I think that's pretty intuitive for most of us, is that people are more likely to follow directions or recommendations from someone who they believe has authority or expertise. 
And of course this applies to one's parent, especially as a child. You, it's a survival instinct to trust your parent. It's, it's all you know, they're supposed to be safe. It's not a child's fault for believing their parent. Fourth is social validation. People are more likely to take an action if they see that more and more people have already taken that action. What I think about here with alienation is other people who are also pulled into the fold of the alienator's beliefs and in, in, in sharing those same beliefs that the alienator, these other people, extended family members, friends, whoever it may be, that enforces the alienation because of that social validation aspect. Number five is scarcity. People find objects and opportunities more attractive to the degree that they are scarce, rare, dwindling in availability. Yeah, people like rare things. I mean, even today I was in Costco and like I was buying Christmas presents and there was a big expensive a car for kids to ride around in. And I asked like, hey, is this on sale? They said, no, it's not on sale, but it's the last one. And I bought it. This is just yeah, human nature, guys, human nature. I'm not exactly sure how that one applies to parental alienation, but number six, liking or friendship. People prefer to say yes to those that they know and like. Simple as that. Of course, one's parent will fall under that category. There was a psychiatrist named Margaret Singer, and she studied these prisoners of war, and she laid out six conditions for thought reform. Her six conditions for thought reform are what allow an individual to believe he is making his own decisions when in fact he has been influenced to disconnect his own critical and decision-making capacity. Hello, this is parental alienation right here, because the child believes that they're all his beliefs, they're all his decisions, and the child does not realize they are being coercively controlled to reject their parent. If I had realized that, I would have been begging to stay with my dad. I had no clue, okay? No clue. When I read these six conditions, I had to put the book away. It is, for lack of a better word, triggering. I hate the word triggering, but it was a lot to read. This is really, really what I went through. So number one is to gain control over a person's time, his physical environment. She mentioned specifically with gaining control over their time, their thinking time. So if you can get a child to be ruminating about the situation and anxious about seeing their other parent and really sad and thinking about how their other parent has done all these things all the time, you've succeeded as an alienator. That's what they do. If you can gain control over their physical environment, such as getting full custody or getting the child to believe it's their own decision and refuse to go with the other parent, thus getting full custody, the alienator has succeeded. Number two is to create a sense of powerlessness, fear, and dependency, while also providing models for new ideal behavior. A sense of powerlessness, fear, and dependency definitely happens by painting the other parent out as unstable, abusive, mean, unloving, uncaring, any of the above. What the child does, at least what I did, is I thought, well, then I can only count on my mom. You only have one parent you believe you can count on, which does create a sense of helplessness, powerlessness, and fear. Third condition for thought reform that Margaret Singer puts forth is to manipulate punishments and rewards to suppress the recruit's former social behaviors and attitudes. This can be really subtle. This can be as subtle as if your parent is saying something about your other parent that they want you to agree with them, something negative, and they want you to agree with it about the other parent, and you do agree with it, they might they might smile and give you a hug. Like, it could be that simple. But yeah, they like try to mold the child by using punishment and reward, give them punishments whenever they show lingering signs of love for the targeted parent, and then giving rewards whenever they outwardly reject the targeted parent. It's really sick. Number four is the opposite of what I just said, so it's to manipulate punishments and rewards to elicit desired social behaviors and attitudes. The one that comes to mind for me is every Wednesday night and every other weekend, my brothers would always go with my dad. But for the longest time, well really forever, I didn't go. So Wednesday nights were often like fun mommy and Maddie nights and she would get out like the special pedicure stuff to do our nails and we would watch a good movie and I would get to pick out a treat and we go to Blockbuster, I get to pick out the movie, we'd popcorn and it would be like our special time together. 
in refusing to go with my dad, I would be able to get this time with my mom and eat stuff I liked and watch movies I liked and to feel special and important because my brothers didn't get to do that. Number five, create a tightly controlled system with a closed system of logic where dissenters feel their questioning indicates that something is inherently wrong with them. I cannot stress how applicable this is. If I ever questioned anything, I was made to believe that it was my problem for questioning it, that something is wrong with me. This is not just my experience. I've spoken to dozens of child survivors now and then. This is very common across the board. This is why the child ends up with really poor self-esteem and self-destructive effects that play out in multiple different areas of their life because the alienator makes them believe that they have something wrong with them when they really don't. The alienator has a heck ton wrong with them, actually. Number six is the point that really got me. The sixth condition for thought reform is simply to keep recruits unaware and uninformed that there is an agenda to control and change them. It makes sense, right? Like the moment that someone becomes aware that there's an agenda to control and change them, it's impossible to do so. Lastly is cognitive dissonance and the evolution of the bite model. You might have heard of cognitive dissonance before and how it applies to alienated children, but I want to define it for anyone who is unfamiliar. Dissonance is the psychological tension that arises when a person's behavior conflicts with their beliefs. And in 1950, a psychologist named Leon Festinger discussed dissonance. He said, if you change a person's behavior, his thoughts and feelings will change to minimize the dissonance. The common example that people give is a vegetarian eating meat. In this example, the vegetarian may eat meat and they might begin to rationalize to themselves why it's okay, even though they may have held the belief for a long time that eating meat is wrong. They might try to convince themselves that it is, in fact, acceptable to eat meat. And they would do this in order to minimize their discomfort internally. So Festinger not only talks about cognitive dissonance, but he comes up with this model. He has three components to his theory about basically how um, cults gain control over a person's identity. And Dr. Hassan actually adds a fourth component, which is the I in the acronym BITE. So the acronym is BITE, B-I-T-E. And it basically says that in order to control someone's identity and replace it with a new cult identity, you need to control these four things. Behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions. And it's an acronym, easy to remember. I wanna talk a little bit about like each individual aspect. Behavioral control. Behavioral control is the regulation of a person's physical environment and their conduct. Physical environment referring to their habitat, their companions, their food, their sleep. From my own experience, all of that was controlled. And then their conduct, their tasks, their rituals, their activities, their day-to-day -day structure. With the behavioral aspect, obedience and good performance is often rewarded with gifts and praise. And disobedience and poor performance is often punished with criticism, demotions, or chores. When it comes to information control, the I in the bite model, information control begins by the cults withholding or distorting information. In the case of parental alienation, this would be the alienator withholding true information, distorting true information, and creating false information. It says, quote, people are only given the information they are ready for or as much as they need to know. Insider doctrines are reserved for people who are thoroughly indoctrinated. And in my experience, as the only child of five children who was targeted, I can say that this is absolutely true. I was the only kid targeted, but only say certain things or use a certain tone when we were alone. Just me and her. She would not disclose certain information to my brothers, and it always bothered me why I knew so many details about the divorce and all the proceedings that happened, and my brothers knew nothing. And there was a time I had a family meeting and confronted all of it with her in front of my brothers, and she lied and denied everything I'd said. 
With information control, there's also blocking critical or negative points of view. This can be like monitoring the internet usage or someone's cell phone. I had no privacy whatsoever, including reading my journals. It can include members of a cult spying on one another and reporting improper activities or comments, such as criticism of the leader, doctor, and organization. This is so common. Oh my gosh. The triangulation in my family did not begin and end with my dad. And with me. It was all of my siblings. We were all triangulated against each other, mostly me against my brothers and my brothers against me. A legitimate organization allows people the freedom to think for themselves, read whatever they would like, and talk to whomever they choose. Destructive influence group attempts to do the thinking for you. There you have it, summed up in one little package. The T for thought control. It's it's pretty simple. It says a cult's doctrine is seen as the absolute truth and the only answer to a member's problems. Cult doctrine teaches its members, we are the way, we are the truth, you who are not in the group are lost. The doctrine is not open to interpretation. Cult members are taught that the leader is always correct. Disillusionment is the fault of the member. That is so important. So if the child ever questions their alienator at all, the child, like I said, is made to believe it's a problem inside them that they need to resolve. It's not a problem with the alienator, it's a problem inside them. Finally, the E in the BITE acronym is for emotional control. It says, quote, emotions tell us things we need to know. Cults gain control over members' emotions by keeping them off balance. On one hand, cults make people feel special by showering them with praise which is a practice called love bombing. On the other hand, cults manipulate members to create dependency. <sighs> this is so true, so true. There's intermint there were intermittent gifts, intermittent words of praise, intermittent feelings of love bombing, which makes it so confusing as an alienated child, and that's how the loyalty bomb is really created. After the love and idealism, the cult world fills with fear. Fear binds members to the group. This is really important. The whole time I was alienated, and especially at the beginning, more than any other emotion, I was afraid. I was afraid of my dad. It talks about phobias. Phobias are an irrational fear, and I definitely had a phobia of my dad. I think a lot of alienated kids have a phobia, an irrational fear, unjustified fear of their targeted parents. The control of behavior, information, thoughts, and emotions, each aspect on its own, has the potential to alter someone's identity. When all of these forms of control are used in conjunction, the effect is even more extreme. It mentions at the end that the bite model exists on a continu continuum. You might have some kids all in the same family, like a sibling group, for example, where one child is severely alienated and the other child is less alienated. That's because all of this is on a continuum. I want to end this part one by talking about the, the pseudo identity that's created in place of the person's authentic self. I'm just going to read the last paragraph of this chapter. Dr. Hassan says, in a destructive cult or a controlling relationship, the locus of control shifts to the person in power. The recruit abdicates his ability to make decisions. A pseudo identity is created which suppresses the authentic self and surrenders control. Individually is, individuality is submerged and free will subverted. People are kept in the dark and the very processes that influence them are often made to seem spiritual or mystical. Access to any contravening information is cut off. I'll talk about this more in part two, but just to give a heads up about what this is and how this relates to alienation, there's a lot of emphasis on how when you're interacting with your loved one who is in a cult, in this case an alienated child, it's essential that you recognize the differences between the pre-cult identity before the recruitment, aka before the alienation, and the cult identity, which is during the membership or during the alienation. It says, even people who are born into cults have an authentic self that has been suppressed since birth. It is the strength of the authentic self that makes it possible to rescue people from cults after many years, even decades after they join. When informed family and friends begin working as a team to educate their loved one about destructive influence, the cult identity and its barriers will begin to crumble.
And that just gives you a little understanding of how parental alienation is, is a destructive cult. I want to hear from you guys. I'm really curious to hear what you guys think about all of this. Does it sound familiar? Do you agree that parental alienation is a destructive cult? Have you gotten the book? Are you reading along? Part two is going to be on this. The strategic interactive interactive approach. Dr. Hassan lays out the methodology for how to get your loved one out of a cult successfully without using force, deprogramming, or exit counseling, or reunification programs, any of that. This is how to do it in a different way. This is something that I don't think anybody has really applied to parental alienation yet that I have seen. This might give some people a lot of hope and maybe some new ideas. We're going to apply Dr. Hassan's methodology for getting your loved one out of a cult to how to get your alienated child out of a cult. That's the end of this video. I hope that you enjoyed and got something insightful or new out of this video. Please leave in the comments what you think of the book so far. What are your thoughts on parental alienation as a destructive cult? I'm really excited to film part two. I might need a little while to kind of decompress from part one. It's pretty intense because I've been through all this. So I appreciate your patience to get part two out, but I promise it's coming. And then I'm gonna organize our reading list for next year. If you have any suggestions for books that you would like to be covered next year for our book club, please leave it in the comments. As always, please hit the like button to get this video in the algorithm so that more and more people can learn about parental alienation. We also have a, um, a newsletter going out with bunch of exciting stuff. It's the best way to stay in the loop with the Anti-Alienation Project. Well, I'll leave a link in the description for how you can sign up to get emails, newsletters, everything exciting. We're having our website launch soon with a bunch of exciting opportunities for how to reach through to children outside of family court and how to provide them support when they do figure things out. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate everybody out there who has been tuning into my videos, listening to my messages, and sending me words of encouragement. I try to read all the messages that I can and reply to all of you guys that I can. It's a little overwhelming sometimes because of the amount of messages, but just know that it means so much to me and there are days when I want to stop and there are days when I just would rather forget it all, but I keep going. Not only because I want to fight for these kids and help these kids that are going through it, but also because I've gotten a lot of really good feedback from you guys and heard how much it has given you hope and has been helping you. So that really is what keeps me going. And I just want to say thank you so much. So that's all for this video. I hope you have a good day and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.